Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of the Couch GM's podcast. I'm your host, George Kurth, here along with the other two Pro Bowl selections, voted in by us, obviously, Tyler Snyder. What's up, everybody? And Cody Rocap. How's it going? Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of the Couch GM's podcast. George, Tyler, and myself are three best friends. We love talking football. The season's not quite over, so we're going to have more fun just talking about football this week. And if you're wondering what you can expect from this podcast, well, this week's going to be a little different because it is Pro Bowl week. Uh, you're going to get some weekly headlines. You're going to get some recaps of last week's conference championship games, some early Super Bowl talk. And then we are going to have a special treat of a Pro Bowl roster draft, a seven on seven game. It's going to be fun. So stay tuned. It's going to be a lot of fun. And you guys can vote on which roster you think is best from our seven on seven draft on social media and follow us for a bunch of other fun content as well. Make sure you get involved. We are on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at the couch GMs. So with that, why don't we jump into weekly headlines and more specifically, we might as well give a coaching update for everybody. We were talking about coaches getting hired left and right last week, and there's two teams left, and one of them filled their spot this week, and that'd be my Philadelphia Eagles hiring Mike Sirianni from the Indianapolis Colts. He was their offensive coordinator. What do you guys think of this move before I go on my little rant here? Well, it's Nick, so you uh, you uh, have to get your coach's name right, so apparently you don't like it, but yeah, Nick Sirianni out of nowhere. Uh, I'm not 100% sure why the Eagles went this route. Uh, but, you know, as a Packers fan, you know, no one expected Matt LaFleur to get hired. We hired him. He he looks to be a really smart coach. So maybe there is something in there. Frank Reich, you know, he might have been the mastermind behind your Super Bowl, and he had the recommendation for Nick Sirianni. So Eagles fans, it's another questionable move. But what can you say about that organization? Yeah, it's just absolutely questionable. I mean, I know that there was a lot of drama being stirred up by Eric Bieniemy's agents saying that it's a, a race thing at the fact that he is not hired yet. But honestly, I'm not sure what the reasoning is why Bieniemy hasn't been hired yet. I mean, he's one of the top coaching candidates uh, for the last two years, and the Eagles are one of only two teams that needs a head coach, and Bieniemy's still out there. So I don't understand why they wouldn't. Uh, you know, give a little more time and go for a top guy like that instead of this questionable move. No, I definitely agree with you there. And I mean, last week I was telling you guys like they should definitely wait it out at this point with only the Texans being the other team left to at least interview the enemy and see what you have to offer. I don't know if there's some reason that he hasn't been hired. I hope it's not race, but maybe it's just he doesn't interview well. Maybe he's being carried by Andy Reid. No one wants to believe it. I really doubt that, though. He seems like an amazing head coach candidate, but I I don't absolutely hate the move. I'm sorry. Your name is Nick. I will get that better, but I think it's a really good move for the quarterbacks. However, the Eagles want to go, whether it's Carson Wentz, which seems to be the case or Jalen Hurts, but I'm not convinced that it is a good move for the team as a whole. And they did start assembling the the offensive coordinators, quarterback coaches, defensive coordinators around it. I don't hate some of the moves, but again, it seems like it's all quarterback centric. It's a quarterback game. Maybe it'll work out, but I'm a little bit concerned when it comes to the rest of the offense around the quarterback position. Yeah. George, real quick before we move on to the next uh, topic, it does look like though longtime assistant coach Deuce Staley would not be back. I know he was looking forward to getting possibly the offensive coordinator role. What are your thoughts on losing a guy that meant so much to that organization? I mean, a little bit of bias as a fan because I loved him when he played running back for the Eagles and then came back and he's been an assistant basically since he retired. And he has made so many running backs wearing Eagles Midnight Green super productive. He kept that really crowded room in 2017 when you had LeGarrette Blunt, Jay Ajayi, Corey Clement when they won the Super Bowl, they kept them all happy, even though they all weren't getting the workload they probably deserved. I'm worried about running backs as well. I don't think as much because Miles Sanders is such a great talent. I think he's going to be okay because he already is so good, but it does concern me that he's gone. I feel bad as an organization that's already been ripped apart, basically taking someone they were so loyal to them for so long and throwing them out to the side. I wish he would have gotten an offensive coordinator position. But here we are. 
All right, guys, well, let's go ahead and move on to our next headline, which is uh, the complete opposite of the Eagles hiring a head coach, and that is the Texans still looking. Uh, do you guys think they're just holding out and waiting for a guy like Biennemi, or do you guys think they have somebody else in mind? Well, I know, I believe it was reported today or maybe yesterday, they uh, were interviewing Leslie Frazier, the defensive coordinator for the Bills, and David Cauley, the offense, uh, or not the offense, the assistant head coach of the Baltimore Ravens for second interviews. Um, so maybe they have them down to those two guys. Again, not two, gu two guys that had a lot of buzz at the start of the coaching search. Uh, but Leslie Frazier, you know, former head coach of the Minnesota Vikings, he has a decent track record. He's a very good coach. So I think that's the way they're going to end up going unless they try to hold out hope for Biennemi. I think Biennemi is the, if we can save Watson, let's get this Biennemi. But I think at this point, Watson is pretty much done in Houston. So they're going to go with the guy they want instead of trying to appease their quarterback. If you were a head coach candidate, would you even want to come to Houston? I mean, the division's already looking tough. I mean, the Jaguars are looking at getting one of the top quarterbacks in the draft. You have the Colts, who are targeting big players, and they already had a pretty good roster. The Titans, who are a playoff team. And on top of that, I mean, they don't have Hopkins. Uh, Watson wants to leave. They don't really have any backbone to that team. No first-round draft picks. If you were a head coach, why would you even want to come to Houston? I mean, I thought it was going to be one of the young guns that wanted to go to Houston, someone that didn't have a lot of interest elsewhere, but just wanted to get a head coaching job and get his name out there and start to build his resume. I didn't think anybody with any kind of significant experience wanted to go there, but Leslie Frazier might be that exception. Maybe he wants to show he's still a head coach. Maybe he wants a challenge. I don't know what it is. It's definitely not appealing. As with not having draft picks, not having a franchise quarterback, most likely. I think that's why that's definitely the last job available. It makes sense. But I the candidates remaining, at least Frazier, doesn't make much sense to me why he would even want to go there. I guess the big thing that would be would be job security. You'd have to imagine that whoever the owner slash general manager brings in, they know their situation. They know it's going to be a couple years of rebuild. So they're telling the coach, like, look, you, we want you to do as the best job you can the next two years, but really year three is when we're going to start evaluating you or, you know, unless there's something like a colossal meltdown or something. I just think there's some job security there. And I think a guy like Leslie Frazier would make a lot of sense. You know, he definitely a, a leadership figure across the NFL, a solid defense, which the Texans are typically been defensive led, uh, teams not maybe coaches but defensive led teams I like the fit for Frazier again Frazier wasn't also a guy that wasn't talked about at the beginning of the the process that we're now hearing about as a potential candidate and that's probably because a lot of the top guys like Brian Dayball also from Buffalo he was like yep I'm just gonna wait till next year and he went back to the team so pretty inter pretty interesting situation there in Houston but that's enough talking about a completely messed up franchise uh but let's look forward a little bit you know there is one game left it's the big one but the senior bowl is happening right now as as we're recording this podcast draft season is among us prospects are getting hyped up again i know you guys haven't been big college fans but does is there anything about like just the draft season you know especially now that your team is out of the playoffs that gets you a little bit excited for football uh, during April and May when it's pretty slow from the actual NFL? Well, yeah, I definitely think that after the season, I start looking forward to the draft a little bit more. The Senior Bowl kind of hits at a time where I'm more focused on things like the Super Bowl or, in this case, the Eagles hiring a new head coach. But um, I always look more forward to the Combine, which we talked about last week, is a big question mark for even happening, which is a big disappointment to me. But it's nice to see that things are still moving along despite COVID concerns, despite like we can hopefully finally put this all behind us by the time the next season starts and everything seems to be a lot more normal. I think it's definitely interesting to watch because, you know, if you're a fan of a team that didn't do anything this year and you have an early round draft pick, you know that the guy who could turn your franchise around might be waiting in the wings. And it gets you excited uh, watching the Senior Bowl, watching these guys, and trying to figure out who that guy might be. And if you're a team 
Um, I'll just use my team as an example. If you're a team like the Titans who looks like they are good but not great and they're a couple pieces away, it makes you excited to watch this, trying to see who those couple pieces are. I know the Titans really need pass rush, so it's making me watch these pass rushers a lot harder, um, really hone in on them. Uh, you know, it the Senior Bowl, it kind of gives you hope for next year. You're just looking at these guys. Uh, trying to scout the talent out just like the GMs are right now, hoping that one of these guys is really going to be the difference maker for your team. Absolutely. I know two years ago, Senior Bowl week, I fell in love with Devo Samuel. I wanted him in Green Bay. and Of course, he went to San Fran and looks fantastic. There's always one player that sticks out. Guy that's caught my eye so far this week is Demetric Felton. He's a running back out of UCLA but he runs really well for the wide receiver routes. So a guy that comes out of the backfield, he's a little bit smaller, could be a fun, intri- intriguing weapon for some team. Guys like that, you know, he was projected fifth or sixth round. He might move up to day two or out off of the senior bowl performance, especially with no combine. But just seeing these guys' stories always get me excited. I always say uh, the draft is one of my favorite parts of the whole NFL process. I know, Snyder, you're a big free agency person. George, I don't really know. You just like football, so you like it all. I just like Uh, football. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, pretty much. You just like football. So the Senior Bowl is happening. It gets people excited for the future. Um, But, you know, talking about the future, someone who is going to change his future, Jason Witten, announced his retirement again. So one, congrats to him on a a fantastic career again, especially not finishing it in Dallas. I did see he's going to sign a one-day contract to officially retire as a Dallas Cowboy, but playing it out with the Raiders. What are your thoughts on Jason Witten? And I'm just going to ask it. I pretty much know the answer. Do you guys want him back in the booth? I feel like it read my mind when you asked that question. I was about to, that was going to be the only thing I was going to say, but really though, congrats to Jason Witten on a great career. Hated watching you for years in Dallas. Cause you would just kill the Eagles and underrated. Maybe one of the better tight ends, uh, that ever played the game you weren't the most physically gifted maybe but hands amazing and uh it's it's kind of fitting that he is going to sign a one-day contract to retire with the Cowboys I mean it was weird seeing him play in uh o- or Oakland or L or Ooh. Las Vegas oh Ooh. almost really Ooh, we got an he did play in Oakland for a year he did play in Oakland for a year did he not yeah he did Yep, so he played in Oakland for a year and then Las Vegas. It was weird to see that. I know he wasn't really super involved, but fitting he's going to retire as a Cowboy. And do not go back to the Monday Night Booth, please. That Just don't. Yeah, I hope he doesn't go back to the booth because, honestly, I don't think he was that great. Uh, maybe he would be a decent commentator for a um, position specialist. So if something happens on the field that is big for a tight end or a tight end makes a crazy play, they bring in Jason Witten and he breaks down the play. Uh, you know, bring him in here and there to go over that kind of stuff, but not uh, an entire game coordinator. But yeah, he did have a great career. Um, 17 seasons that he played. That's just absolutely insane. 38 years old. Uh, congratulations to him. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what he does now. Absolutely, Snyder. Well, that wraps up uh, the main headlines for this week. So I don't want to. I'm not- to avoid this part of the show let's get into the conference weekend recap and we'll start with the first game the green bay packers fall to the tampa bay buccaneers tom brady gets to his 10th super bowl rogers fails to get back to the big game again his fourth consecutive nfc championship well not consecutive years but fourth consecutive nfc championship loss guys what is your takeaway from the packers versus bucks uh, well, there's so many, honestly. Um, I think that the Packers were definitely the better team, and I definitely think the refs influenced the game. But at the same time, I think the Packers shot themselves on the foot uh, in multiple occasions. I think uh, let's go first or last play before the half. The Buccaneers have one play where they can try to get a touchdown or try to get closer to field goal range. And the Packers go cover one man. They have one safety over top, and everybody's in man coverage. And they just have the receiver, it was Scotty Miller, go deep on the outside. The safety couldn't get over in time. He beat his man. Uh, King definitely had a terrible game. And it was a touchdown for the Bucks. I mean, why would you call that defensive coverage? 
in the last play before the half. It makes absolutely no sense. you got to go cover three at least and have some safeties over top. Don't allow the big play. Don't allow the touchdown. And then in the second half, I mean, again, I know that the refs influenced some plays, but the game came down to Packers needing eight points to tie the game up, and they had the ball third and goal. Well, honestly, second and goal from the eight-yard line, and Aaron Rodgers had some room to run, chose not to, threw it incomplete, and then third and goal, again, had some room to run and threw it incomplete. I don't understand why he didn't try running it, why they didn't give A.J. Dillon, who was having a great game, a chance to run it. Uh, but if Rodgers would have ran the ball at least on that third down play, even if he didn't score, then he got fourth and goal from about the two because he had a lot of open room. And you know, fourth and goal from the two with one of the best offenses in the league, you have to trust that they can score that. And then on top of that, following that up, they did fail on that third down play. So fourth and goal from the eight, and they kick the field goal and try to rely on their defense. I just, I hate the call. You have a potential MVP uh, quarterback and one of the best offenses in the league, and it's, you know, the whole game on the line. You have your chance to go to the Super Bowl on the line, and you kick the field goal and say, let's go play some defense, which has not been their strong suit this season. I just don't understand the call. Uh, so many times the Packers made questionable calls, and I really think that they lost that game more than the Buccaneers won it. Yeah, absolutely, Snyder. I definitely am with you. I believe they were the better team. If you look at the numbers, Aaron Rodgers was the best quarterback on the weekend. Uh, by QBR and passer rating, just which is crazy after how m well Mahomes was played, but we'll talk about that game in a little bit. Yeah, you know, like you said, the play bef before the half where we give up the touchdown, two plays before that, we got pressure on Tom Brady. He throws up a duck, and our safety, Will Redmond, literally lets the ball fall through his hands. Before that drive even started, you know, Rodgers threw the pick, and, you know, you talk about the refs. Uh, I can't think of the first part of his hyphenated name, but Bunting was pulled himself closer to Alan Lazard to get himself in the position to make the pick. The holding went uncalled. Unfortunately, we had the fumble that injured Aaron Jones in the second half that, you know, pretty much, you know, we wanted to double up in that game and it allowed the Buccaneers to essentially double up with a touchdown right before half and right out of the half. And once Aaron Jones got hurt, we like abandoned the run. We had three interceptions in the second half against Tom Brady. Two of those times we went three and out on three passes for each drive. I don't know why. Like you said, A.J. Dillon was pl playing pretty well. There was no threat. It was the first game that it really showed how much we missed Bakhtiari. We weren't helping our tackles on the edge. I think Green Bay just got too cute, got too carried away, got too far away from what got them to that point. I agree. I think the refs definitely influenced the game. But at the end of the day, there were so many mistakes that the Packers made that they didn't even really need to be in that position to have to get a stop to win the game. They could have won that game fairly easily if they just converted more. It's frustrating as a Packers fan because it's happened now four times since 2014 that we have lost the NFC Championship game. This one was at home. This was actually Rodgers' like, best championship game performance. Again, I said he was the best quarterback this weekend. He still lost. It's a tough one. I don't know if I'll ever get over it. I agree with you. We should have kicked or we should have went forward on fourth down. I personally don't think Rodgers would have scored. If you rewatch that third down uh, play, one, he hesitates when Adams first flashes open if he and he like almost pump fakes. If he would have just slung it there, Adams would have caught the touchdown. I think, uh, I believe it was Carlton Davis was double teaming Lazard. He would have been able to run off and stop him. And I also think he didn't run it because he thought they were going for it on fourth down. He was surprised when they kick it. I've heard reasons why, you know, LaFleur was trying to win it in over t or in regular time instead of forcing the game to overtime. But I don't understand how you can take the MVP off the field and trust your defense when today we're sitting here going, is Mike Pett? fired how did you put your hands in a guy that two days after might not even be back instead of the most likely mvp of the game very questionable calls it's a tough one uh but congrats to tom brady what he's been able to do is remarkable to get to so many super bowls so congrats to the bucks as a whole tom brady didn't do too much he actually tried to lose the game but 
congrats to that organization. So as I said in that last segment, I just like football. And there's so many things you can point to that you guys have already pointed out. How the Roger, how Rogers um, didn't, you know, how the Packers didn't play their best game, or how the Bucks still made some mistakes. But I think my biggest pet peeve as a football fan is when it comes to this situation. I just want a game that's called straight the whole way. The refs don't influence it, and this game made me so angry because I just felt robbed. Was that play to give the Bucks the first down to seal it pass interference? Yes. Did they call pass interference once the entire game? I don't think they did. There was the Bucks interception that was uh, holding on the defense or pass interference, however you talk about it. That should have been called. That wasn't. There was at least three other times there was holding or pass interference both ways that just weren't called. But then they picked that convenient time to call it. It almost looks like it's the no call pass interference in that Vikings versus Saints game years ago that completely changed the outcome of the game that just made me feel robbed then. Also, you can look at the same exact play of that questionable pass interference they actually called. There was holding on the offense as well that no one talked about that would have maybe resulted in a sack or at least if they threw the flag would have been offsetting penalties and the play would have been run again. So... I don't even really care what happened before that because the refs dictated the end of that game. Rodgers should have had another shot, maybe didn't deserve to win because of how poorly they were playing despite them getting turnovers of Brady, them abandoning the run game. But it was dumb for them to kick that field goal, but the gamble paid off and we'll never know that it paid off because the refs didn't give them that chance to get the ball back like they should have had. Yeah, it does suck when you, uh, you know, you put so much heart and energy as a fan or even, I can't even imagine the football players on the field because if you w- watch that play, they were celebrating. They they had done their job and they were walking off the field when that flag comes into the screen. It took Like seven seconds late too. Seven is, I feel like, generous. I feel like it took like 15 seconds, but right? that's besides the point. Again, I'm not saying it wasn't holding. Like it was definitely holding, but to your point, you let five other holding penalties go in the game. You and, you know, they a always say convenient time to call that one, especially when there was another penalty on the offense on the same play. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's just like how they don't call pass interference on a Hail Mary. They did that They're once like, this year too. Didn't they? Didn't I remember that happening earlier in the season? Probably. They probably did, <laughs> but you're, it's just, it's just, it's sucks to you know put all that heart and energy into it to watch the officials change the game. I, I don't know how to fix it. You know, my girlfriend was like, why are there more officials? They have all this money. Like, how are they missing these? Uh, you know, we saw Aaron Jones, like have his face mask pulled for like the 13th time again this year that has gone uncalled, which set the Packers back because the next play was a sack and they punted instead of being 15 extra yards. It's how the game was. As soon as Cleet Blakeman was announced as the ref, I wasn't very excited. Uh, he has the best all-time bad lip reading, but he's he's not a very good ref in my opinion, or at least his crew isn't. Um, I can talk all day about how I think the Packers were the better team, but I, I don't think our listeners want to listen to that. So I'll let you guys wrap up this game if you have anything else. No, there's not really much to say because it, it really doesn't matter what we have to say about this game. Uh Ultimately, it's over. Uh, the Bucks are moving on. If anybody put money on the Bucks to win the Super Bowl right now, you are uh, definitely in sitting pretty on making some good money because they were not expected to make it past the first game and definitely not expected to make it past this game. Um, it's a heartbreaking loss for the Packers, but like I said, ultimately it's over, so it's on to the Super Bowl. So, guys, let's go ahead and move on to our next matchup, uh, which is the Bills and the Chiefs. And I don't know about you guys, but when I watched this game, when I saw the Bills go up 9 nothing, should have been 10 nothing, but, man, kickers suck this year. Uh, when the I saw the Bills go up 9 nothing, I was like, wow, here we go. The The Chiefs are going to miss the Super Bowl. Like, it's, it's the Bills' time, finally. Uh, the momentum was completely on their side, and from that point on, it just completely dropped off. I don't know if it was... Josh Allen collapsing under pressure if it was the coaching making bad calls or if it was really just the Chiefs outplayed him but 
man, that game shifted momentum quick and never turned back. Yeah, I had major flashbacks to Chiefs Colts when I was watching that game. Bills get up at nine nothing and then miss the extra point. For whatever reason, the switch went off in my head. I'm like, the Chiefs were down four touchdowns in a playoff game once and came back and won. This is nothing. They're about to go run off on a streak here. And they did. And I think it was like twenty one to nine at one point. So for whatever reason, like I saw it happening and as soon as the missed extra point happened, I'm like, the Bills are done. And I don't know why I thought that, but it happened to be the case, and it's really disappointing because I think the Bills early were playing the better game, and if they would have just kept the foot on the pedal and not let something get in their head, they they blew it. Yeah, I don't know what it is about the Chiefs and playoff comebacks, but, I mean, they did it all last – every game last year they did it. Uh, they came back in this one. The Chiefs, they look good. And, you know, I heard Tyreek Hill after the game – He I think it was after the game or maybe it was Monday – he said, it felt like everyone on the internet forgot who we were. And I was like, you know what? There is definitely some truth to that because they were 14 and two and everyone was like, oh, this is the Bills year. Or the week before it was like, oh, it's the Browns year. Like everyone forgot how well oiled the Chiefs offense is, how much better their defense was playing. I just hope Mahomes goes into the Super Bowl and destroys Tom Brady because I can't believe it's not Packers uh, Chiefs, but I'm not going to talk about that anymore. But this game was this game was fun <laughs> uh, because Tyreek Hill was electric. That one play that he should have scored on, that he, he went out like inside the five and he ran like the whole way across the field. The Chiefs are just such a fun team to watch. And when Tyreek Hill said, it's almost like the internet forgot who we were, it definitely dawned on me that maybe I wasn't giving the Chiefs an, an, enough credit because – Unfortunately, if they keep winning, they'll become, you know, the New England Patriots or the Golden State Warriors, where everyone's just sick of them. Uh, but this team is definitely a, a lot more fun and a team that I'll root for, at least for now. Yeah, that offense is so stacked. And, you know, it brings me back to a comment where I was like, I'm honestly not excited for this Super Bowl at all because it's, you know, Patriots or basically Patriots of old and the Patriots of new it's Tom Brady versus uh the new up and coming dynasty and I remember George saying wow you changed quick because I, I definitely was a big Chiefs fan I was rooting for them I mean they had Patrick Mahomes and I was a big fan of Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey they were so exciting to watch that I was a huge fan of them for years now and now it's just it's like a bad taste in my mouth. It's like I can't even root for them because I just see them becoming this new, the new Patriots, the new dynasty that's unbeatable. And, you know, football is just less exciting to watch when the same team wins every single year. We finally got the Patriots to fall apart. So you think that that is finally over, but it's not. I mean, the Chiefs are here. Mahomes isn't going anywhere. I tried to defuse him a little bit also by saying like it's only year two of them making it to the Super Bowl. Yeah, you can argue they were pretty good a few years before that, but it was the typical old Andy Reid. I get to the NFC or AFC championship and then I just choke um, and that might happen again. And I feel like there's a chance that the Chiefs window closes in maybe a year or two, especially with having to pay Mahomes all that money. I don't know what the heck the uh, Patriots um, excuse was for being able to keep it together that long, but I feel like. That literally hasn't happened ever else in NFL history. So I don't think you can argue that. I don't think there's a great argument that the Chiefs are going to turn into the Patriots. I think it's a better chance that you're going to see Chiefs be dominant for max five years. And then you're going to see them maybe hang around in the playoffs because they're never going to be awful with Mahomes at quarterback, I don't think. But they probably won't be the superpower that the Patriots were for years and years and years. Well, let's just remember, this should be the Chiefs' third consecutive Super Bowl. The one two years ago when, uh, I think, it was a Frank Clark, is that who they had at the time? Yeah. Was, like, in half an inch off sides, you know, and Brady threw a pick, so the refs threw a flag. Oh, uh, look, the refs dictated get... a game? Oh, I'm sorry. That was, that was but, bad. so, yeah, I mean, the, the Chiefs look dominant. I'm with you. It'll be interesting, especially this year with the whole cap situation. I know they paid a lot of guys on – I don't know what the official cap number for 2020 is, how many people they'll have to restructure or cut uh, to get under that number. But the Chiefs look like – I actually agree with Snyder. I think the Chiefs, at this rate, the way they're playing, the p people they have in place, you know, 
Sneed, their cornerback, was like the 12th or 16th cornerback taken, and he looks like a, an all-pro corner already. The way they're drafting, this Chiefs team is scary. Hopefully it gets a little bit more competitive. I know it's going to be it's going to be worse for Snyder being an AFC team fan and uh, me and you as NFC uh team fans won't have to see the Chiefs till the Super Bowl and we'll just be excited our teams there. Uh but Chiefs Chiefs Buccaneers it's going to be a good one as everyone knows because they've said it 8 billion times that the Buccaneers will be the first team to host uh, a Super Bowl in their home stadium. Makes a good reason to throw a flag to make sure that happens. Just saying. I'll start the conspiracy <laughs> theories. I don't care. But I'm on board. Let's do it. Yeah, anyways, George, you said that there's no good reason to argue that the Chiefs are going to become the next great superpower like the Patriots were, but I think there's a hundred good reasons. I mean, what made the Patriots as good as they were? Uh, you could say it was uh, great coaching. Now, who's to say that Andy Reid isn't just as good of a coach as Bill Belichick? He might not have the rings yet, but honestly, Andy Reid has had a great career, and we can see what he's doing with the Chiefs now. Um, yes, he has choked in the NFC Championship in the past, but he had Donovan McNabb. Now he has Patrick Mahomes, and you can't put McNabb anywhere within spitting distance of Mahomes. I don't care how early in, career, in his career it is. Um you could say it's great quarterback play. Again, you have Mahomes, who is one of the most electric quarterbacks we have ever seen. Uh, you could say that maybe it's because Brady was the NFL's golden boy, so they just really wanted to help push him along and push those conspiracy theories. Uh, tell me you can turn on NFL Network for five minutes without seeing Mahomes somewhere on a Beats commercial, on a State Farm commercial, on anything. Uh, I think there's so many reasons you can argue it. Uh, they have their big pieces like Tyree kill and Patrick Mahomes locked up for years. And like Cody said, no matter how low in the draft they're drafting, they are still getting really good players. These rookies are coming out and looking electric uh, people that no one's talking about in the draft. And then they draft them and boom, they look great. So I think right now they're a scary team. I don't see them slowing down anytime soon. Um, I think the chiefs could be dominant for a long time. And honestly, I would not be surprised if Mahomes finishes his career with more Super Bowl appearances than Tom Brady. Oh, that's pretty bold. I will say that that's pretty bold just because of how how rare it is. Um, you know, Tom Brady has 10. I mean, Mahomes will be at two, two this year, so he'll be a fifth of the way there. I mean, it's definitely possible the way the Chiefs are playing. I do hope, at least for the NFL's sake, that it does get a little bit more competitive. You know, maybe they, they're they always a top team, but a team like the Browns or a team like the Titans last year, you know, no, that no one that came out of nowhere strong at the end of the season can get over that hump and maybe limit their Super Bowl appearances. But who knows? We got a long time uh, to debate Patrick Mahomes. Like you said, he's he might be the best uh, pure quarterback we've ever, of our lifetimes or ever. We'll have to wait and see how that plays out. So we have we have the Bills, not the Bills. Well, I'm so sorry, Bills fans. Probably got your hopes up a little bit there. But no, we have the Bucks and the Chiefs to the Super Bowl. Just some quick headlines uh, before we wrap this up. For, head into the Super Bowl. We're going to talk about it all next week. Uh, but Mahomes is dealing with turf toe. Unfortunately, Eric Fisher tore his Achilles in the championship game. Antonio Brown should be back, adding another offensive weapon. But the one that's most interesting to me, I don't know if you guys saw it on Wednesday afternoon, Scotty Miller uh, said he's faster than Tyree Kill. Now, to me, I think he just looked fast because he ran by Kevin King. <laughs> but what are your guys' thoughts? Do you think? Do you really think Scotty Miller's faster than Tyree Kill? No, I honestly think Tyree Kill might be the fastest player to ever play in the NFL, and I don't really think forty times are uh, super accurate all the time. Maybe somebody's not having his best day. Maybe somebody is having his best day. Um, I mean, there's some people that you can make arguments for, like, dang, they're fast. But Tyree Kill, I feel like, makes every single person he runs next to seem slow. You can say Chris Johnson in the day back for the Titans was super fast, and he had a 40-time record for a while. I saw an argument also before the Scotty Miller thing came out that said, was Deshaun, is Deshaun Jackson in his prime or Tyree Kill faster? The answer is Tyree Kill. I don't see anybody who ever just shredded defensive backs consistently the way that Tyreek Hill does. Yeah, I mean, if you do go off a of 40 time, 
Uh, Scotty Miller has an unofficial 4.39 40 time, and Tyreek has a 4.29. So just based off of that, Tyreek is faster. But there is a quote that I have heard watching football for years that it took me forever to fully understand because it didn't make a lot of sense to me. But there is a difference between quickness and speed. And both of them are fast, but they're not both as quick. Uh, so what I mean by that is if you just have them both run a straight line, Scotty Miller might be able to keep up with Tyreek Hill. And that is just pure speed right there. Um, I still think Tyreek would outrun him. But besides that, with quickness, Tyreek Hill, you watch him on the field and he is making juke moves and uh, he will run all the way to one side of the field and all the way back. And he will run 13 different routes in one route because he's cutting so quick. He is so quick that you can't keep up with him. I think he could... Uh, outrun Scotty Miller in any type of route, even the craziest of routes, and I don't think that that can be competed with by anybody in the NFL, um, wide receiver or otherwise. I think that Tyreek is definitely the quickest receiver in the NFL. I completely agree with everything you just said, you know, about the quickness and speed. You know, guys like DK Metcalf, MVS, those, you know, taller, long, but fast guys, that you know, they might be able to beat Tyree kill in a 40 yard dash or a hundred yard dash if it's a straight line but once they start making cuts no one is catching Tyree kill and he is super like I mentioned he's super fun to watch I feel like you're someone's playing Madden with him you know maybe there's a couch GM up in the booth he's a robot and he's like right stick circle B whatever if you're Xbox or PlayStation you know spin moves jukes Tyree kills electric I don't think there's any chance for uh, for Scotty Miller but that's enough Super Bowl talk. We got a lot more to talk about next week when we actually break down the game, make our predictions. But as we mentioned at the top of the show, it is Pro Bowl week. So, you know, the NFL is doing Pro Bowl a little bit different. They're playing video games, having social media contests. So we're going to do something fun for the Pro Bowl. We're going to come together. We're going to draft our best seven-on-seven seven roster. So Think of it as each team would play each other with these seven players. Now we're going to stick to mainly offensive skill players. So we're going to have two quarterbacks, two running backs, a wide receiver, a, or two wide receivers, a tight end, and a flex. It'll be seven rounds. You said two quarterbacks, obviously. by the way. It's okay, one quarterback. well, I said two quarterbacks. I lied. It is one quarterback. Thank you, George, for catching that. But, Tyler, you won our picks, so you get the first pick. You can talk about your pick, but uh, you're on the clock. All right, guys. Well, having the first pick is tough because there are so many good, talented guys in this Pro Bowl that you could choose from. And, you know, the homer in me definitely wants to pick a guy like Derrick Henry. But I think the most important position, no matter what, uh, doesn't even need to be debated, is always quarterback. And as much as I would love, especially in a seven on seven street football type of game, would love to have a guy like Josh Allen who can scramble out of the pocket. I think it's hard to pass up from the best quarterback in the NFL this season, and that guy is Aaron Rodgers. So my first pick, I'd have to steal Aaron Rodgers. Interesting. I was not expecting you to take him at all. I wasn't. You gotta change so, it up. Okay. Yeah, you gotta change it up. So I'm on the clock now. And I'm torn uh, because you you took Aaron Rodgers, who I didn't expect you to take. I thought you would take one of the two guys I wanted. So now I got to see if I can play the game on who will come back. But you know, I just we just talked about you know he's like a freaking human Madden game. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take Tyreek Hill with my first pick. Smart at wide receiver. The speed on seven on seven is this flag football? Because if it's flags, you ain't catching his flags. I'm just saying. <laughs> Actually, can we like establish his flag or not here first? Because if it's street football, okay, got you. <laughs> street tackle football. Right, we're playing NFL street of old. Okay, well, Cody did take my pick. I was going to go Tyree Kill right there, but if we're going street tackle football, it's got to be Derrick Henry right here at number three. I don't see anybody being able to tackle Derrick Henry one on one when you have extra open field. He's still fast. I. I think that's a steal right there, but I do get your arguments for the other two. I think Tyreek Hill would have been my next guy. All righty. So the first round went Rodgers, Tyreek Hill, Derrick Henry, and surprisingly, Derrick Henry or Aaron Rodgers didn't go to their fan favorite team. Pretty interesting. All right, George, kick us off for the second round. 
This one is tough, but I really liked the quarterback argument, so I'm going to go with who I think is the second best quarterback in the league right now, or at least this year, and that would be Patrick Mahomes. He was the other guy up for MVP. Going to have somebody solid to lead my team, and then I'll worry about my pass catchers later. I like it. I like it. Well, since you guys have both taken a quarterback, uh, just out of the nature of this draft, I well, theoretically you could take a quarterback in your flex, but I will pass on a quarterback to my last pick. And, you know, I'm going to stay with that explosive offense, and I'm going to get the best tight end in the league. Oh, and I'm going to take Travis Kelsey. That's my pick. That was my pick. That was I was debating between him and Tyreek Hill with my the second overall pick, so to be able to get him, him here in the second round. I don't have a quarterback yet, but I have a pretty dominant uh, one-two punch pass catching. Yeah, Cody. I mean, you can make an argument for just about any running back or just about any receiver um, at any point in this draft because all of these guys are amazing, but you cannot make an argument for any tight end over Travis Kelsey. I don't care. It's not possible. Kelsey is so far and above all the other tight ends in this Pro Bowl. He is on a level of his own, so that is a great pick right there. Um, But you know what? I'm going to go ahead and take a pass catcher because Aaron Rodgers has to throw to somebody, right? And I'm going to go with Devontae Adams. I mean, it just makes sense. I mean, Aaron Rodgers to the Devontae Adams connection has been absolutely electric this year. It has been unstoppable. Uh, So I just have to keep that connection together. I'm going Devontae Adams. I love it. I'd probably vote for your team at least. So that's <laughs> that's one vote for you because <laughs> you got two of my favorite players. But hey, we're off to a great start. So why don't you kick off a uh, round three, Snyder? Sure thing, sure thing. And you know what? I'm gonna go with a running back here. Now it would make a lot of sense to go with a guy like Dalvin Cook. Uh, because he is a great running back. Uh, He was one of the only guys who competed with Henry in the yards this year. It would make a lot of sense to go with a guy like Alvin Kamara because he can catch all the passes out of the backfield, but I am not going to go with that. I'm going to go with one of the best average running backs, uh, uh, best yards per carry, and he did the best while he was on the field, although injuries did limit him, and I'm going to go with Nick Chubb. I think that he is such a dynamic running back. He is an 80-yard touchdown waiting to happen every time he grabs that ball, and I really do think that he would be competing with all of these guys for the top spot if he was able to stay healthy all year long. Well, I took your pick, and now you took my pick, so fantastic work there. I was leaning Nick Chubb, but I, I too will go running back and take the other option. And I'm going to go with Alvin Kamara. I think his pass catching is a little bit better than Dalvin Cook. I think he's a little bit thicker, a little bit less injury. And you got to play defense on our seven on seven. So I like him as a little, uh, little strong safety. So I'm going to go with Alvin Kamara. And you took my pick again. He was going to be one of my guys in this, uh, this turn here even though it would have been my second running back because I would have had my pure runner already he would have been my pass catching guy so I'm going to go ahead and get my receiver and that's going to be DeAndre Hopkins I I kind of wish I could see this in real life Patrick Mahomes thrown to DeAndre Hopkins he's got crazy skill around him already but he doesn't have a possession threat quite like DeAndre Hopkins the only thing he's missing is the speed of Tyreek Hill but I like him there as well Already, and you got a second pick uh, to kick off the fourth round. Since you took my second running back, I might go back to back on receiver here, and I think I'm gonna go with. There's a lot of good options in the AFC. I'm looking at a couple. There's AJ Brown, Keenan Allen, but I'm gonna go with Stephon Diggs. Stephon Diggs completely changed Josh Allen's career. He showed how much of an asset he is at the receiver position. So put him with Patrick Mahomes as well. And I think I got a good mix of some great receivers from Mahomes to throw to and that power running game right now. Diggs was a great pick. You know, I thought about taking him and since I don't have a quarterback pairing him with Josh Allen, uh, my next pick, I'm going to stay with receiver and it's, it's kind of, just also stealing him from Snyder but my next pick will be AJ Brown from the Tennessee Titans man stole my pick again the dude is a monster physical and fast the guy can make unbelievable jump ball catches 
and also can take a slant 70 yards. Very underrated still in the NFL despite playing with bad ankles and knees, I feel like, all season and putting up huge numbers. A.J. Brown, Tyree Kill, Travis Kelsey, Alvin Kamara. My offense is scoring 100 points like that. That was a pretty bad snap. You couldn't hear the snap on the mic, but <laughs> pretend I all snapped. Editor, add a fake snap in. <laughs> all right, Cody. Well, you know what? If you're going to steal A.J. Brown from me, uh, I understand that I'm the only one who has an open receiver spot, but the flex is still open, and I want to make sure that you guys don't steal him from me. I'm going to go with a guy who is just as much of a freak and honestly gets a lot more recognition than A.J. Brown, deservedly or not. I'm not sure. That's a debate for another day. But I'm going to go with D.K. Metcalf. He is another guy who has freakish size and speed. He can go up and make the play. Um, And he's the kind of guy that you just, you know, D.K.'s down there somewhere, throw it up, and the odds are he's going to go up and get it. He can outmuscle pretty much any corner or safety that goes up against him. And, again, if we're playing street football, uh, these guys are going to have to play defense, too. DK is going to be taking some heads off on defense. We saw what he did to Buda Baker, chasing him down, making that tackle. Give me DK. I like it. So a uh, quick recap after four rounds. Snyder's team is Aaron Rodgers, Nick Chubb, Devontae Adams, and Decaf Metcalf <laughs> with three spots left. I have Alvin Kamara, Tyreek Hill, A.J. Brown, and Travis Kelsey. And George has Mahomes, Derrick Henry, Hop, and Stephon Diggs. Tyler, you're back on the clock, top of the fifth round. All right, guys. Well, we're, we're getting down to the nitty-gritty here. The obvious picks are off the board. Um, but, you know, I get a second running back, and I am surprised that he is still there because he was the second-best running back in football this year, and I'm going to go with Dalvin Cook. Uh, I I can't believe he fell this far, but I got to make sure to lock him up. I mean, we saw what Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb can do side by side. Imagine what Nick Chubb and Dalvin Cook could do side by side. That's just dangerous. Absolutely. I was hoping he would get back to me, um, but he didn't. Surprise, surprise. I'm with you. I thought he would be, you know, top two rounds essentially because how well he played, especially this season. So I, I, too, need a running back. There's not too many left. So I'm just going to go with the home favorite. I'm going to go with Aaron Jones. He's very elusive. He has good hands out of the backfield. He's very similar to Alvin Kamara. A little bit of speed. And I like him over Josh Jacobs, which is the uh, the remaining running back on, on the board. So I'm going to go with Aaron Jones. All right. So... Me having three spots left, I'm going to go ahead and take my tight end here. And obviously, the obvious tight end choice is off the board with Travis Kelsey. So I'm going to go with the second favorite and the guy who I think still doesn't quite get enough um, talk. And that would be Darren Waller. Darren Waller has completely emerged as besides George Kittle and Travis Kelsey being the third best tight end in the league. He can take over a game if you allow him. He just doesn't have a lot of weapons around him on that offense. And I think that's why he doesn't shine as much as he should. And I think with a team around him, like Henry D hop and digs, he can really make them make some moves, do some damage. I don't blame you for taking Waller there. That's a good pick. That's going to be my pick. If you fell, but George, you are still on the clock. So who do you take with your next pick? Well, I have one more running back spot open, but there is only one on the running back left. So do you guys have to save that for me? Is that how that works? We don't have to save anything. Okay. Yeah. There's no there's no gimmies in this draft, George. Well, I'm going to go bold here anyway. I'm going to add a little size and toughness to my team, and I'm going to go with Kyle Juszczyk. He's going to be better for me here playing some defense. He still can be a solid running back, and he catches some passes out of the backfield. Lead blocker. Derrick Henry has a great lead blocker already with Corey, Corey Blassing game, so give him Kyle Juszczyk as well. Good dynamic guy who could also play some defense for me. I'm going to take the risk on that one right there. I like it. Fun, exciting, a little bit different. Not what people expected. But that brings me back to the clock here. And I'm looking at my flex position. I said I was going to wait till the end for my quarterback, which I am going to do. And I'm going to have to go with my, my draft favorite, who's on one of my least favorite teams. 
but I love the player still. I'm going to go with Justin Jefferson, wide receiver for the Vikings. Had a fantastic rookie year. Another, you know, guy that's very quick, has good speed. I, I don't. I think any of these guys are gonna have a hard time fighting my or defending my trio of Tyreek Hill, AJ Brown, and Justin Jefferson, which I'm pretty sure Tyler was on one of your fantasy teams in the league we were in. You had all three of these, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. It was a good yeah. fantasy year for me. <laughs> what can I say? It, it was. That was a pretty good team. Uh, so. Maybe my my have the best team on this. You never know. Uh, but speaking of your fantasy team, you are you are back on the clock. You got a tight end and a flex left. Round out your team here, buddy. All right, guys. I am on the clock. I have my last two picks here. I have a flex spot open and a tight end spot open. Flex, I'm still debating between a couple people. So I'm gonna go ahead and take my tight end and just get that out of the way first. I have either TJ Hawkinson or Evan Ingram to choose between. And I'm a huge fan of Evan Ingram. I really am. I think he is uh, definitely athletically gifted, but I'm actually going to go with TJ Hawkinson. I think that he is a sure handed threat in the red zone. I think if you get down to the red zone, throw it up to TJ, he's going to get it. And I believe that he would be a lot better in the NFL. If he had someone better than Matt Stafford throwing to him, hot take, not a big Stafford fan. Uh, So I'm going to go with TJ Hawkinson to fill in my tight end spot. And then, guys, we're going to the wide receiver or running back slot. I have either Josh Jacobs or Keenan Allen to choose from unless I want to go with someone interesting like a fullback or a um, special teamer. And, you know, I was planning on taking Kyle Juszczyk in my flex here. That was going to be my surprise pick. But since George took him, I'm going to go ahead and take Keenan Allen. And Keenan Allen has been so good this year. And... You know, he's doing it with a rookie quarterback that he doesn't have that good of a rapport with. So you give him, I mean, honestly, think about it. Keenan Allen has been one of the best receivers in the league for years now. And he's had Phillip Rivers, who can't throw, throwing to him. And Justin Herbert, who is a rookie, again, doesn't have a rapport with. So you match him up with Aaron Rodgers. Just imagine how good he could be. Uh, I think it would be absolutely dominant. I'm going to go with Keenan Allen here. And, you know, good luck stopping my team. Hey, I will give you Keenan Allen and Devontae Adams probably one, two in route running. So especially when we have, you know, receivers playing corners in our imaginary seven on seven game. Uh, that's some that's some deadly combos with as accurate as Aaron Rodgers in. So I do like your flex pick there. I get to wrap up my team now and I, I'm the only one that doesn't have a quarterback. And I, I don't know wh- which way to go. I, I know Josh Allen had a great season. Russell Wilson had a very strong start to the season and died down. And then there's, you know, the X factor in Kyler Murray. You know, my team is pretty much all speed. You know, it'd be fun to have Kyler Murray out there. I'm, mm, it's a tough one. I mean, I don't understand go... Sean Watson though, either. I mean, he also might not have had the best season, but he is very mobile and, you know, he performed well without really having a team around him. So you can't really undersell him either. You got four good choices here, man. I know it, it's so tough. I think, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to stay safe. It was between Josh Allen and Deshaun Watson. I'm going to go with Josh Allen strictly based on size. And again, we do have to play defense on seven on seven. It won't be very tough defense, but I'll take a guy that's a little bit, a little bit bigger that still has some decent wheels. I'll take Josh Allen. To round out my team well there's a couple of debates here i can either just go with josh jacobs fill my running back spot and be over with or i can think about the fact that my team's a little bit bigger and i might need a little bit more speed to play secondary there on the defense and i can get a little bit more dynamic so i'm just gonna go ahead and make things interesting and i'm gonna throw kyle use check instead of my flex into my second running back spot because he does play in the backfield And I'm going to go bold, and I'm going to pick a second quarterback. And that second quarterback is going to be the most dynamic quarterback with his legs I think there is in the league, and that's Kyler Murray. Kyler Murray can throw some passes from some backward passes from Patrick Mahomes. He can go out there and play in the secondary against some of your fast guys out there like Tyreek Hill and still probably keep up fairly well. So we're going to see how that works for me, but I think I just need a little bit more speed. So that's why I'm staying away from Jacobs, and I'm going to go with Kyler Murray. 
Very interesting. You know, you're definitely playing to like the NFL street strengths of like throw it to a guy, the guy jumps off the wall and throws like a 50 yard bomb with your two <laughs> quarterbacks there, their mob- mobility. If the, if it was, you know, we said it was NFL street rules. So if we were playing in a stadium, I don't know about that, but if you're playing in an alleyway somewhere in Detroit, wherever the game was modeled after, Hey, Kyler, that's just a fun team. You have like the biggest man ever. Your team's going to walk out with Derrick Henry and he's going to be like flexing. And then Kyler Murray is just going to step out beside him like this small guy. Maybe Derrick Henry just runs and Kyler Murray stays behind him and no one will ever see him. You definitely have some, a lot of character on your team. So I, I like the pick. I do. And you got the D hop connections. So fun yeah. team there, George. Way to, way to shake it up here at the end. Yeah. I mean, got to make this interesting. I mean, the boring pick, I think, would have been um, Josh Jacobs. And no one wants to see a boring pick. Absolutely. So just a quick recap, Tyler's team is Aaron Rodgers, Nick Chubb, Dalvin Cook, Devontae Adams, DK Metcalf, TJ Hawkinson, and Keenan Allen. My team is Josh Allen, Alvin Kamara, Aaron Jones, Tyreek Hill, AJ Brown, Travis Kelsey, and Justin Jefferson. And George's team, Patrick Mahomes, Derrick Henry, Kyle Juszczyk, D-Hop, Stephon Diggs, Darren Waller, and the surprise flex of Kyler Murray. These picks will be uh, on our social media, so please tell us who you think would win. Maybe give us some score predictions, who you thought had the best draft. You know, it's just a fun way to talk about the Pro Bowl when the Pro Bowl is a joke anyways, but they're doing things different this year, so we thought we would too. But guys, before we go, let's have a quick lightning round. The NFL Award Show will be Saturday night, or not this coming Saturday, but the following Saturday, the night before the Super Bowl. Final award predictions, we'll do it real quick. I'll just say the the award and just give me who you guys will think will win. We'll start it off with the MVP. All right, I'll go first here. MVP, I think my obvious choice is Aaron Rodgers. I think Rodgers had the best year for all quarterbacks, and it's a quarterback award. I'm with you. Some people might think I'm a home, homer, but I'm taking Rodgers for MVP as well. I know it's a quarterback award, and I know we're doing who we think is going to win it, but I don't think it's fair unless he gets a mention, so I'm going my boy, Derrick Henry. Hey, I like it. it. It'll be like the only the second time a 2,000-yard rusher didn't win it, which was also Chris or CJ2K, which is kind of weird that Tennessee running backs get that. But we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but we got Offensive Player of the Year next. And that's where I slot Derrick Henry in. I do think he deserves some MVP conversation, but if he doesn't win Offensive Player of the Year, it's robbery. Yeah, I don't. I'm going to say Adams, but I really do believe it's going to be Derrick Henry. But Adams had a fantastic year, put up incredible numbers, especially missing two games. But you're right, George. This is pretty much Henry's award pretty easily. Guys, you know, this is going to sound crazy, but I'm not going Derrick Henry. Based off of usually whoever wins MVP does not win Offensive Player of the Year. So with that case, I'm not going to give it to Henry. I'm going to give it to Travis Kelsey. I th- he was a better receiver than pretty much every receiver in the league this year. I got to give it to him. Very interesting pick and definitely could be one I could see surprising people and coming away with that award. But let's flip over to the defensive side and do it the defensive player of the year. I'm going to go with the best of the Watt brothers and it's not JJ. It is TJ Watt. Yeah, I, I think he has a good chance. I'm going to go with Xavier Howard led the league in interceptions played lights out pretty much carried that Dolphins defense so Xavier Howard is my pick couldn't agree more Cody I'm also going with Xavier Howard Alrighty, and then that means we got the rookie award so let's start it off with offensive rookie of the year I think this is a very interesting award because there's so many people that could get it and I'm going to go with the quarterback that wasn't even drafted first and that's Justin Herbert amazing season for him even though his win-loss record might not have showed it Yes, this, this award is very intriguing to see how it'll fall. I mentioned it when we did our draft. Justin Jefferson was a big fan. I'm a big fan of his. He put up incredible numbers this season. I think he has the Offensive Rookie of the Year award wrapped up. All right, guys. Well, both of those guys definitely performed well, but Herbert was the sixth overall pick in the draft. Jefferson was the 22nd overall pick. When you're that high in the draft, you're expected to be good. One guy who was not expected to be good was James Robinson, running back, for the Jacksonville Jaguars wasn't even drafted and he was one of the best running backs in the league this year I'm giving it to him nice sleeper pick definitely 
one that probably should be in consideration. Uh, probably won't actually end up in there, but I do like the sticker pick, and hopefully he does get a little bit more respect than we're expecting. We'll flip it over to, which I think might be the hardest award to give out this year for the Defensive Rookie of the Year. I wanted to give this to Jeremy Chin, who was my guy at the be- uh, in the middle of the season, if you remember back to our uh, midseason recap show. But I'm going to give a little bit of love to Anton Winfield, who was an all-year starter and really came out of the gate strong. He might be the best run-defending safety in the league, so give him some love. Give him a uh, defensive rookie of the year. Yep, another great pick there, George. But I'm going to go with your guy from the middle of the season, and I'm going to go with Jeremy Chin. He meant a lot to that Panthers defense that was actually pretty good. Just their, they would struggle in moments. But Jeremy Chin had a great rookie season, and I expect him to grow uh, into a, an elite player in the years to come. Guys, I'm going to go with the guy that was expected to win it all, and I'm going to give it to him anyway, and I'm giving it to Chase Young. He didn't have as many sacks as I expected him to have this year, only five and a half. Still a great year for a rookie season, but he did have three forced fumbles, nine tackles for loss, a fumble recovery, three passes defense. He was absolutely dominant, and he helped take a team that didn't deserve a playoff spot and lead them into the playoffs, so I'm giving it to Chase Young. Very interesting to see how that one wraps up. Uh, but I do like the Chase Young pick as well. And for the last award, we got Coach of the Year. There's so many great candidates. Uh, what do you guys think? I've been riding the Bills bandwagon the entire season, so I'm going to stick with it and say Sean McDermott did a great job and he deserves the Coach of the Year award. I'm with you, George. I thought it was between McDermott and Brian Flores. Brian Flores didn't make the playoffs. McDermott did. What they did with Josh Allen was pretty remarkable. McDermott takes home the Coach of the Year award, in my opinion. Sean McDermott took a Bills team that was good and made them great, which is impressive. But Kevin Stefanski took a Browns team that has been absolute hot garbage and the joke of the NFL for the past um, decade. And in his first year, led them to a playoff berth. And to me, that is absolutely insane. And I think that Kevin Stefanski definitely deserves it. I love that pick. Alrighty. Yeah, that's a great pick as well. You know, I think we all have some intriguing options, so definitely be interested to see uh, when these awards get announced and how accurate we were. Uh, but that wraps up this episode of Pro Bowl Week. As always, thanks for listening. You can follow us at the Couch GMs. Please leave a comment, like, subscribe. Hey, if you want, leave a five star review. If it's good enough, we might even read it on air. Absolutely, guys. And you know what? This podcast is a lot more fun for us and more fun for you when you get involved. So please get involved. Let us know who won the Pro Bowl draft. Let us know who you think would win all of these awards. Um, Just get involved, guys. It's a lot more fun. Trust me. And thank you one more time for listening to the Couch GM's podcast. We look forward to doing more of this fun stuff for you in the offseason. But next week, we talk Super Bowl. So we'll be looking forward to see you then. For Tyler Snyder and Cody Rocap, I'm George Kurth, and happy Super Bowl week eve. And boom goes the dynamite.